same problem I did before where I didn't quit my email program. I'm sorry. This is the this is the one problem of Mac users is that you have to Yeah, I love the Mac though, so I'm not going to get a PC. Sorry. Stop whispering, Stephen. Um, my uh, perspective is is I, I can say that I'm probably sitting here today because of space art. Um, that's what hooked me when I was five years old. Um, the illustrations in my astronomy books when I was a kid were, as I've, as I've written, like magic portals that transported me from my house, my parents' house in Great Neck, New York, um, to other worlds. And it was pictures like this one. Um, Chesley Bonestell's rendition of, actually there are people in this, in this picture down here, little, little tiny explorers uh, on Saturn's moon Mimas. Um, this painting was, was uh, executed in the, actually 1949 by Bonestell and first appeared in Life magazine and then in the, the landmark space art holy grail almost of co called Conquest of Space. And he had many imitators uh, throughout the 1950s and 60s, many of whom illustrated books like um, the Golden Book of Natural History and uh, Time Life did a book called The World We Live In, which actually did have Bonestell artwork in it, and on and on and on. And it was the art that really grabbed me uh, by the collar and said, this is the most fantastic thing that humans have ever done, and it's, it's going to be happening and unfolding in the future, in the near future, we hope. Future, we hope. So really it was the art that got me before anything else. And my perspective on space art today, what I'd like to talk about today is the role that space art has played in helping to enable the future. And the reason I say that is, as Mike alluded to, Space art has a number of functions. One is that it, it does provide a snapshot of our understanding of a particular world at any given moment in history. So here's a painting of Mars that was done um, in the late 1950s by Bonestell uh, for the world we live in, and, uh, or for Life magazine, and, and then later was reproduced in the world we live in. Um, and it's, it's amazingly accurate, as it turns out. I mean, the, 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 the sandy desert, the wind eroded rocks, the, the, the dunes marching across the sand surface, um, even the dust devils in the background, which were photographed decades later by the rover Spirit as it climbed up Husband Hill on Mars. The only things that you'd have to change to make it accurate for today's Mars are, number one, remove the green patch in the upper right, <laughs> which was the most optimistic vision of Mars in the, at the end of the 50s, that maybe there might be some kind of simple plant life on Mars. Of course, Mariner 4 dashed those hopes by revealing that Mars was, in fact, a, a frigid radiation-bathed desert with an atmospheric pressure only seven-tenths of a percent of what it is here on Earth. And the other thing you'd have to change is make the sky from blue into a more of a peach or salmon color due to the um, the uh, very thin atmosphere that is filled with airborne dust, the, the dust being that same reddish color as the surface and uh, giving the sky that uh, salmon-colored hue. Um, Bonestell, of course, was also, and this is another, this is the other role of space art that I wanted to, to emphasize here. One of the things that Bonestell did that had the greatest impact was in illustrating the, the visions of Werner von Braun of how we would explore the planets. And this is one of his most favorite, famous, uh, that was done for Collier's Magazine in 1954, uh, and was also incorporated into the book, uh, The Exploration of Mars, which came out in 1956, uh, happens to be the year that I also came out. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a summer of a very close approach of Mars, um, and Mars was on the, the, the public's radar screen in a big way. And it was paintings like this one uh, that, that really gave a convincing picture that these things not only could happen, but they could happen perhaps within our lifetimes. 
Bonestell was aided in his portrayals by his skill as a draftsman and an architect. He had actually had, th this was actually his third career. He started out as an architect, uh, helped design uh, the Chrysler Building in New York City and the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Uh, his second career was as a movie matte artist, special effects artist. He did uh, background paintings for films like Citizen Kane and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And um, then in uh, the late 1940s, mid, actually mid-1940s even, is when his first stuff starts to appear in Life magazine. And um, he really galvanized whole generations of young people, uh, some of whom grew up to be astronauts and NASA engineers and so forth. And this, this vision of a Mars expedition really um, kind of cemented in the, in the public's mind the idea that uh, there's a sort of a manifest destiny feeling that uh, the planets are worlds that are meant to be visited and even conquered, in the, to use the 1950s terminology. Um, in the 1960s, um, space art was no longer used just to imagine voyages that could be, but voyages that we knew indeed would take place. And this is an illustration by Bob McCall from Life magazine in the early 1960s. I love the headline, What Looms Ahead. Um, as an as a, you know, eight or nine year old kid seeing this in Life magazine in 1964 or 65, probably 64, I was probably eight. Um, you know, this, this was how I knew that I had, had lucked out and found exactly the right moment to be a kid because uh, what could be better than uh, having something like this adventure unfolding? And, and I think that the art was one of the things that made uh, space exploration a cultural event. Um, it was very much part of the way that we, as a culture, experienced space exploration, even aside from uh, the photographs, because it was really the art that conveyed the, the excitement even more than, even more than. Um, of course, uh, the big climactic moment of Apollo uh, was the first lunar landing and the first footsteps on the moon. And Norman Rockwell was commissioned by Look Magazine to uh, portray that event. And I still think this is one of my favorite space paintings of all time. It's hanging uh, upstairs in the offices of the Air and Space Museum. And so whenever I get a chance to go up there, I always spend some time uh, looking at that painting. Um, interesting story about this, uh, we all know what a wonderful painter Norman Rockwell was, but apparently he felt a little bit intimidated by uh, trying to paint the Apollo lunar module and uh, actually called on fellow artist Pierre Mion for help. Uh, although Mion is uncredited in this painting, he did provide some assistance to Rockwell in rendering the lunar module itself. Um, of course, we won't quibble about some of the scientific details that are wrong, like the phase of the Earth is completely inconsistent with the lighting uh, angle on the moon, but you know, it looks great, and so I'm not complaining. Um, flash forward to the real Apollo missions, and this is what it looked like with a real lunar module sitting on the surface of the moon. Um, so, you know, we saw, this is from Apollo 14 in 1971. What I'm trying to get, at, get across here is that if you grew up in the 19, if you were alive in the 1960s, you saw that, sp that space art indeed was an accurate predictor of reality. And um, it still can play that role today. Um, of course, it, it also continues to play the role of uh, imagining what has not yet happened. Um, this is a picture I showed yesterday during my uh, talk on uh, history of space exploration, of Mars exploration. But I, this is our Viking intern group at uh, JPL, the summer of the Viking landings. The reason I show this picture, though, is to uh, call attention to the backdrop, which is at the Jet Propulsion, it was at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it was painted by Don Davis, who is one of the great space artists. And um, to me, this painting is the last vestige of the Mars of the imagination. Uh, it does show the kind of golden desert that uh, we've seen in other paintings, but, and, and the very deep blue uh, indigo fading into black sky, which was a, a reasonable guess at the time based on the very thin atmosphere that we knew existed based on the Mariner 4, Mariner 6, and 7 data that showed a very low atmospheric pressure and therefore 
uh, if there was any color in the sky, it would be very uh, dark. Uh, so I was actually hoping that Mars looked like